market. I hope you will have a lot of questions at the end of the presentation. Because today I'm going to speak about the how the um, data virtualization technology and the architecture of logical data fabric can really fuel the artificial intelligence. Let me quickly introduce myself. I'm uh, working with the data for almost 30 years by now. Uh, I started with Russian Academy of Science doing some you know, scientific researches and uh, doing uh, the data process and data modeling. Um, after some time, I moved to Finland. I worked um, for Nokia Corporation, managing and building the global Nokia data integration platform for almost 10 years. That was an interesting time. Nokia was a great company to work with, uh, similar to Apple or Google right now. Um, then I worked for Deutsche Bank in the same role, so I did pretty much a lot of have pretty much a lot of experience being on the customer side. After some time, I decided that I'm more like interested in the consultancy career. I switched, I moved to um, work for the companies that are purely uh, dedicated to data management, like Teradata and Informatica. I'm sure you, you've heard those names. However, two years ago, I joined Zenodo in the role of the data management director and the chief evangelist for the big region. And today I am with you uh, live uh, from Dubai. So welcome once again, and uh, let me start my presentation with the kind of the something that everybody speaks now. Even Jose mentioned that many times. This is the typical kind of a data scientific workflow, something that the steps that the data scientists have to go through when they start the project. First, we need to gather the requirements, understand the business problem, we need to identify and ingest the data useful for this particular use case. Then we need to spend some time to cleanse the data, to make the data conform to certain standards, analyze the data, prepare the input for the algorithms. And after that, we are executing our data scientific application algorithms, Python or R or the tool of your preference, training the model. The last but not the least step is to visualize the outcomes and share that with the, uh, with the business community. However, if you take a look at this life cycle wheel, you can really see that 80% of the time that we spend doing data science has nothing to do with data science as such. We spend a lot of time to finding, preparing, getting access to the data, trying to analyze and find another data sets and some features that would be valuable for us. And then only 10% of the time, data scientists doing their job uh, training the algorithms. Let me take a couple of steps back to understand better how we traditionally provided the data for data science, provided the data for the analytics. It's pretty much not the not the kind of a new approach, all right? We've been doing that for decades already. And if we take a look at that, we've always been following uh, kind of the data gravity approach. So the big data set should attract the smaller one, getting bigger, bigger, and bigger. And the whole idea of data management, data preparation for the analytical and reports of purposes was to bring the data into a single something. In the beginning of the century, it was a single data warehouse. When I started to build my first data warehouse with Nokia in year 2001, that was exactly the idea that we did following. Take all the data you have, bring them to the data warehouse, allow the access to those data to um, analytical tools. And then by, do, by going this way, we can really uh, provide the needed data for the analytics and reports. After some time, uh, some time, the technology has changed and everybody starts speaking about moving data to a single data lake for analytics. However, the concept of data gravity stayed the same. Again, the same approach, move all the data you have physically into a single data lake and then uh, put your analytical and machine learning tools on top of that and get your insights. Needless to say that it basically never happened. Neither of those uh, approaches never worked. We ended up having a lot of data sitting in the data warehouse, a lot of data sitting in the data lake, just side by side in the same organization. Or uh, recently, we start hearing the story: let's move all the data to a single cloud, and then we can really provide the data in a single place for the for the analytical projects, for machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Again, I my understanding that this 
never gonna happen by this or that reason. We have some government legislation preventing us to moving all the data to the cloud. We have some company internal regulation that a certain data sets should not and cannot possibly leave the firewalls. We are ending up having the architecture that is completely uh, different from this kind of data gravity approach. And that's how we did following the data gravity principles. That's how we manage the data. We get the access to the data sources. We extract the data physically, move the miser to the staging area of data warehouse, the landing zone in our data lake, physically copying the data, actually creating a copy of the source data. Then we move those data to the core data warehouse model or to the trusted zone of data lake. However, the idea still was the same. Move data physically again, over and over again. Read data, do something with them, clean them, prepare them, write back. After that, we had a next step of creating departmental data marts that the financial department was one data mart representing data in a certain way for marketing department. It could be another data mart representing different kind of data. However, we still made another copy of the data. Only doing all those steps we were able to connect with our reporting and analytical tools with the data marts and do our job the downside of this approach was always clear for the data professionals first of all we are ending up having five to ten copies of the same data it's very bad from the security perspective because your data is only as secure as the least secure data set and copy of the data and another Big problem was that it took us like five to six hours on average to move the data all the way from data sources towards the um, uh, business facing data marts, which gives us the only possibility to work with the data from yesterday. We worked with this D minus one paradigm. The reality currently is that data have really this anti gravity property and not a data gravity. Data don't want to see it in the single physical location. What we can see right now are really uh, geographically, technologically uh, distributed architectures. We are having data in the different clouds. We have data sitting in a different data warehouses. Historically, it happened like that, maybe because of some mergers or acquisitions. We have several data lakes in the organization. One department is doing uh, its own data lake, then you can find out and the marketing department has their own marketing data lake collecting the data for their own purposes. We have data in a different cloud locations as well under the hood of a single cloud service provider or we are using multiple cloud service providers. So we live in the reality of data anti-gravity. Data is everywhere. Data doesn't want to see it in a single physical location. And we need to really learn how we can provide all those data for our data analytical exercises for the projects that requires data from various data sources that are really cannot be moved physically to a single place. And I can identify like a three major anti-gravity forces that actually taking those data apart that are not allowing us to store them in a single place. And first of all, it's naturally geography. We have to work with the data that are geographically distributed. Data can be set uh, sit in different data centers in different countries and you don't want to move them to a, yet another single super repository mm -hmm. another anti-gravity force is technology if 20 years ago we only worked more or less with the relational databases and with the flat files with the common separated data now we have the whole spectrum of no sql technologies that are addressing a particular use case of data management like graph databases like uh, document stores, key value pairs, in memory databases, you name it. Technology is the really the force that does not allow us to move the data to a single place again. Those uh, technologies, they're built for the purpose. Uh, data in the form of a graphs, they're really comfortable to sit in a graph database. They don't want to be moved to a relational database or to a data lake. We better leave them where they are. And another, last but not the least, is the ownership of the data. You don't even have to be a huge international company to face this ownership problem with the data. It can be even on the government level that, for example, if you're a small, low cost or airline flying from Dubai to Beijing and from Dubai to Moscow, you're already facing the data ownership problem. The regulation in those countries dictated data about Chinese citizens. They must stay 
inside China borders. And the same rule, same law is enforced in Russia, in other countries. So where do you store your customer data? That's the question. How you can provide all the customer information for your data scientists in a single place? It's becoming simply impossible. What we are facing right now, that the business increasingly demands us to speed up the digital transformation. And for that, we need to provide the faster integration and real-time analytics and access to all the data. Doesn't matter where those data is. They are, again, they are distributed among different geographies, sitting in absolutely different technologies. From time to time, we simply don't have a right to move the data elsewhere. And we need to really learn how we can manage this data and how we can provide the data in a single place without moving them physically. And if the IT organization will stuck in that data gravity paradigm, I think that's the, that's the recipe for, for the failure. Data doesn't want to be in the same place. They're growing across the system, across all the geography, data warehouses, data lakes, cloud, Edge computing devices, data is everywhere. And we need all that data to fuel data science. Without the data, data science doesn't simply work. Uh, let me speak about the concept of logical data fabric that basically addresses exactly this problem, exactly this issue that we have uh, currently with data management. It's completely game-changing um, approach that looks at the data from the consumption perspective rather than from uh, application perspective. Whenever the query for the data comes from the analytical or reporting application, the data is in real time is gathered from all the possible places that can reside and formed in the model that is convenient for the consumption. For the reporting, it can be our favorite star schema or snowflake schema. For the data mastering initiatives that we can form the data in it, uh, form of a virtual data domains, like you're providing a 360 view on the customers, on the products, on companies. For the analytical application for the data scientists, that might be data just cleansed on fly and unified on fly. And also we can provide the data in a raw format for, uh, to train uh, different uh, artificial intelligence models. Again, without moving physically a single byte of data, you can have all the data sets you need in a single place under the hood of a single platform managed by a very sophisticated engine that provides you the way to search for the data naturally as if you go to Amazon and are looking for some goods. You don't even want where those goods are stored, in which data warehouse, which city, who owns that product. You are just searching for that and you're getting the product whenever you need. The approach here is the same. We don't move data physically to yet another super repository to manage them and provide them for analytical and reporting purposes. We are getting those data in the real time without doing unnecessary replication and duplication of the data and providing a near real time access to all data independently if they're sitting in your traditional data warehouse or uh, traditional relational database or they're uh, living inside of your Hadoop data lake or they're in the different, uh, some other NoSQL repositories, like a graph database or its data sitting in the cloud, we can still provide a single place to manage your data virtually. Uh, I'll just want to give you a definition of what Gartner uh, gives about the logical data fabric. And Gartner basically, in the latest release of the technological trends for the next year, uh, the name you see on the screen is a top strategic technology trends for the year 2022. Gartner puts the logical data fabric as number one because this is becoming really critical. We need to learn again how to manage distributed data sets that are sitting across of the organization, across of countries, across of technologies owned by completely different people. A data fabric naturally provides flexible and resilient integration of data sources across platform and business users, making data available everywhere it's needed, regardless where the data lives. So this is the concept of data anti-gravity that we really have to switch to. Look, we've been talking about uh, 
data silos for the last 20 years. Everybody understands that this data sitting in a silo is a bad thing. And we try to address that with all those approaches like data warehousing, data lakes, cloud migration. However, what we did in a nutshell, we created just bigger silos. Now our data is distributed among different data warehouses, different data lakes, different cloud locations. We are just getting to another level of data being distributed, dispersed, siloed. The only way to address this problem of silo data and get those data together is the virtual way. We cannot physically move the data to yet another super data lake or super data lake house just because of the data volume is prohibitive. The technology that we store the data, the variety of those technologies, they're growing every day. And some of the data formats simply not fitting into the traditional data management technologies, right? Uh, we need to provide the our analytics as much close to real time as possible. That's the business demand currently. Nobody is interested anymore what happened yesterday. The business demand is to tell them what's going to happen tomorrow. We need to do the predictive, prescriptive, analytical stuff. We need to provide the algorithms that will predict the future rather than tell us about the past. And if we keep moving those petabytes and petabytes of data just for the sake of providing them for the analytical applications, that's not going to work. This is a really recipe for the failure. Let me give you the little bit deeper look into the logical data fabric platform and how it works, what kind of features and benefits it provides to the end users. You have all your data, doesn't matter where those data are located, doesn't matter what kind of technology you use to store the data, it doesn't matter if the data is static or data coming in real time more than a streaming way from the sensors or IoT devices, from the web logs, the click streams. All those still is data. Data can sit in the Excel spreadsheet. They can sit in the form of a party file inside your Hadoop data lake. They can sit in the form of a graph inside of the graph database. They can be placed into your relational database in the form of a table or whatever it is. We can and we should provide all those data to all those modern data management initiatives that are not limited to a simple reports anymore. We're all speaking about the machine learning and artificial intelligence, data, uh, some other data scientific experiments like predictive prescriptive analytics. We need to provide the real-time alerts to those applications as well. And we need to get the data from all those places. So how do we do that? For that, we build a logical data fabric in between, the fabric that basically connects all the data together and provides them for the consumption in a way of a unified abstraction layer that abstracts the data from all the complexity that is you can see at the bottom of the screen. Because our business uh, consumers, they don't really want even to know if we store the data in uh, some Teradata appliance or in a Hadoop data lake or data sitting in the Excel spreadsheet. The data scientist needs the data clean, unified in a single place, is the ability to get access to those data uh, quickly. And that's exactly what Logical Data Fabric provides. By virtualizing all those data, we are delivering this abstraction layer when data becomes in the form of uh, services, if you wish, the microservices. It's very similar to the microservices architecture that is uh, very popular nowadays in the software development. It doesn't matter which programming language you use behind that interface. You want to provide some functionality in a unified way so that all those microservices can talk to each other and exchange the information. Same way we are building the data fabric for our data sources so that the data is visible as a, in the form of a data service, unified uh, with the common interface and available for everybody. And we are providing the universal truly polyglot access to the data when the data faces the business consumption. That can be the traditional interfaces like a JDBC, ODBC, like to run the SQL queries against the data. We can also expose the same data, virtual data sets, in a way of the web services, the APIs. 
so that anybody can call, ping this web service from a Python script and get the data set right in the programming code. Right? We can expose the data in, a, some, in the form of some modern interfaces like GraphQL and all data as well. And the very important part of logical data fabric platform is our self-service data catalog. Basically, that's a single web-based interface where all the data scientists, all the analysts from business, everybody who needs the data, they can connect to that interface and then can, they can do the search among the metadata and the data, looking for the data sets they need, reviewing that data sets, exporting them if needed. You can trace the lineage and you can understand how the data are moving in behind this like a, a final uh, user facing uh, data interface you can understand what's the quality metrics of the data was the data categorization you can apply some, some tagging and put some description to those data you can define the ownership and the business definitions of the data sets as well and those data sets can be combined from different source locations it doesn't have to be data purely from relational database, purely from data. Like you can combine the two, you can run all the mathematical operations that are allowed for the data arise, like joining them, aggregating them, grouping by, uh, filtering, you name it. Uh, at the end of my presentation, I'm going to give you one very interesting use case that we implemented uh, uh, recently <clears throat> uh, with the company that is called BHP. That is a global leader in a, in actually uh, metal mining and the oil industry. It's a huge company. They have a lot of data centers all over the world, distributed geographically, uh, running different technologies inside of the data centers. They are using also the cloud uh, uh, service providers, the Amazon in, in this case. Even having that single cloud service provider, they have issue that the data in APAC. Amazon data center, not really easily accessible from the uh, US Amazon data center. And the task for them was exactly like that. It, they had to provide all the data from all these locations, all these technologies for the analytical team, for the data scientists, so that they can train the algorithm, so they can give the predictions to the business. And the only way for them, they consider different kind of approaches also following the traditional style of building yet another like a super data lake and moving all the data into that one didn't work for them. So they ended up building this distributed logical data fabric architecture that allows them to exchange the data sets sitting in a different uh, data centers all over the world and they all are visible to people, again, sitting in a different geographies in the form of a single unified interface where you can review all the data sets, you can choose the one you need, you can request the access rights for that, and you can do the job. It will it actually uh, cut the time needed for the data preparation and data acquisition for the data scientists up to 10 times. This is a really great example of how the logical data fabric can be of a, a really great help in when you are building the robust future proven data management architecture. Again, my call to you, we should really stop collecting the data to a single place. We should learn how to connect to the data. And I will, um, at the end of the presentation, I want to give this quotation from the uh, Kevin Kelly book that they call this inevitable, where he speaks about the top like 12 technological trends and forces that are changing the future. And the quote says that the digital transformation requires the shift in the mindset. Sharing the data is more effective than accumulating them. So this is the way we need to follow. Data anti-gravity approach is becoming more and more crucial for us versus the approach of data gravity when we try to collect all the data into a single place. If you remember what happens in the physical, in the real world, when the star is getting bigger and bigger at a certain point of time, it turns into the supernova and right after that into a black hole so that even light cannot leave the gravity of the star right and that's what happened for many analytical repositories that have been built uh, all over the world you can collect the petabytes of data in the single physical place but then nobody knows what to do with the data and that's becoming the data swarms that's becoming the data black holes if you will so again 
just repeating that, you should stop collecting the data, you should start connecting to those data and managing the data in the virtual manner. That's all from my side uh, as of now, and uh, I hope you have some questions. Let's do the Q&A now. Yes, yes. thank you so much, uh, Alexei. Thanks a lot for this amazing presentation again. My pleasure. Uh, because we have lunch time uh, at one o'clock till 2.20, and participants, please get back at 2.20. At this time, I don't want to close this topic of Alexei. So anybody who is staying to have more engagement during lunchtime, welcome on board. Now you have camera and microphone on. Uh, one of our colleagues, Abdul Malik from STC. Uh, Abdul Malik, can you switch on the camera and mic, please? It's better if you just talk about the question yourself. He has a question if you look at the chat area as well. How are you, Alexei? This yeah, is uh, Abdel Hello, Abdel How are you? Senior analytics manager. So I have a question regarding the data leak. So now with the different data sources and different integration, um, uh, and you know the data lake that centralized data repository that you are, will have all the data in one centralized database. So uh, can you manage to have a real time uh, solutions after that, after having the data leak? Look, uh, once your data uh, move into the data lake with some ELC tool, it's already probably not real time. So if you really want to get real time insights into the data, you want to connect to the data sources directly. Whether it's possible or not, that's another question. It's an architectural decision. Those data sources might be a very heavy loaded uh, operational applications like a core banking system, for example, that some legacy core banking that is barely moving, right? Nobody was giving you their real-time answers to that. With that, we usually uh, solve the problem by introducing kind of the, the real-time replication layer, building a mirror of that uh, application database and connecting to this mirrored data. Then we can get the data as close as real-time as possible. However, if there is no business need for that, if you're okay to um, have your data like with D minus one, then you can definitely dump them into the data lake and then Denodo can sit on top of that and virtualize all the data that you have inside and the data from your data warehouse, for example, and the data from some Excel spreadsheets that are not integrated to your data lake. All in a virtual way, all without a lot of you know, investment in the hardware and infrastructure and to, um, it's like ETL, ELT processes. For sure, that's the problem uh, when you talk about the legacy data sources and the huge volume of the data that will cause an area time of day minus one, but some use cases you need to have uh, real uh, time decision. Uh, so I want to see your technique on that. Exactly. Thank you for your answer, uh, Alexi. Exactly, that's becoming the common business requirements, really business as sure. need them. What's happening now? Tell me what's happening now. Tell me what's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody interested what's happened last month. It's already passed. For sure. They want all the to have a prediction on that. That's uh, the new scope. Sure. Thank, thank, thank you so much for this question, Abdul Malik. Thank you. Alexei, sorry, just I didn't, I, I was on mute. Can you stop sharing the screen so that we can see the camera? Abdul Malik, stay with us still. Alexei, if you can hear me, okay, perfect. Now we can see each other. So uh, if there are other questions, please write us. Otherwise I would like to ask uh, myself some questions. So I, I will wait for other questions, but stay with us. I share just the agenda with everybody. Uh, questions, please. Uh, Ahmad, if you have any any opinion about this, Ahmad from the Taiku on the same question. Well, I'm happy actually for this conversation, and it um, I really want to thank you, uh, uh, Alex, for the uh, wonderful presentation in place. Abdul Malik has uh, has has mentioned a very good point uh, regarding the data lake. And um, uh, for joining these multiple data sources, so I'm. Uh, I really know that it's not a kind of a, a yes or no answer because it's it's a design issue, and um, as we mentioned, some kind of information does not need to be 
physically moved all of it as mentioned in the presentation. And however, accessing this information from its source and being able to share it with the right team and the right business users is going to help big time, of course. Uh, so I believe that we can take this uh, discussion further after the meeting. I don't want to hijack the time for the, for the whole team. But it was really an interesting discussion. Uh, would Thank like you so much, Ahmed. And I know that we are working together with data, uh, 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 with data IQ on uh, several en engagements right now. So I, I hope we'll. Yeah, definitely. I would say. We'll be good friends. We'll be good friends. <laughs> it will be my pleasure, actually. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you. Abdul Malik, any further questions from your side? Uh, no, the questions are all answered. So uh, we are done, uh, Alexei. No, nothing to add, yeah? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Musin. Yeah, thank you. I don't I want to be between people in the lunches. Thank you. So well, just I share with you the agenda. Uh, 